Just, I would say, the, the headline of the panel is now having heard such different point of views on uh, scientific storytelling uh, with uh, video. Um, and, and we are, we are uh, part of the design department. Um, this is a session on rapid prototyping, I would say. So let us do a rapid prototyping on, uh, on uh, what could be a video paper, what could be, you know, what, uh, if, you, if you just would have uh, maybe three minutes to think about which, which, which structure and which format should we create, um, if, we, if we would say video is uh, the first publication medium for scientific Content. I'm sure, and I'm sure we have uh, we have uh, uh, different different insights in that. I just want to uh, want to introduce two new uh, two new um, members on, on the panel. Jörg uh, is uh, from Maze Pictures from Berlin, and uh, and he's also or you have uh, you have been the head of production and of in the Center of Digital Cultures at Leuphana University. But he has also a Swiss connection uh, because uh, he's a, he created uh, the format Digitorial. Maybe you have one or two minutes to, to tell us more about that, which is a format. And he's trying to teach and train Swiss museums to use this very successful format uh, for their websites and also for their educational, for their educational purposes. And uh, Gunther Lösel is uh, head of this research project, uh, research video. Uh, he's part of the Institute of Performing Arts and Film at the Zurich University of the Arts, uh, mostly connected to performative arts. Uh, so we have a very, maybe you are the maybe broadest uh, range we have because Jörg is also, Jörg Schulze is also uh, producing big movies, uh, the last was The Happy Prince with Rupert Everett as, as uh, Oscar Wilde, uh, and this is a 19 million euro budget. And on the other side, we have, we have uh, artistic researchers maybe using cameras uh, for the first time and maybe uh, learn how to, how to edit and how to, and how to film maybe for the first time in a half professional way. But, but this is how it is, and this is, uh, this is what our session is about. So if you think about, just as a first question, about what could be, what is in your mind a video paper, which format could, could that be? Uh, Melanie, you wrote your, what was the te your thesis at CAST, your written thesis? Um, I wrote about uh, animated infographics. So, could that have been just a video, as, just a, as a first publication uh, um, yeah, medium, yeah. without any yeah. written? I think it could have been, yes. Um, one thing about, I, um, when you said the question first, I, my first thought was, uh, one really important thing for me is to see the researcher, to see the person behind the written thing. So this is one really important thing for me in this video. So I could see who made this research for me. And I think it's one part of um, believe in what I read. This is one big thing for me. So, so that would mean in every research video, the researcher should be on camera, on screen. I would like this, yes. But okay. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, uh, we've been uh, witnessing something like a performative turn in, in the sciences too, because uh, I think this is the background of what we are talking about. Uh, uh, research has to be performed in a way, uh, which mm -hmm. is strange and people are reluctant and uh, scientists are reluctant. And, a lot of them would not be, like to be in front of the camera, naturally. But the ones that dare to do it, they have, a, uh, they have an advantage right now. So as we talked about it at lunch, it's, a, it's something like a game change going on. And uh, we would like to be part of this game change with the project uh, research video. Because we, th uh, naturally coming from theater, performative turn is, is good for me. <laughs> I like it. 
uh, but also I think uh, that text-based media, which are the, the standard in uh, publication of research, is not apt for what we are doing, as we're coming from artistic research and uh, very much we're talking about knowledge that is embodied knowledge, that is tacit knowledge, and it all gets lost when you translate it to text. So we're trying to uh, be part of that game change, and we realize that there's already something like a video essay, which we were talking about, which is a very, um, it's a very established format, and you can translate it from text to video. And, uh, and there's the video paper that you were talking about. It's a long range between yeah. that. And the uh, uh, research video is kind of like uh, a compromise between that, uh, trying to uh, have a lot of references in it and still have experience, like uh, to, to see the researcher or the artist on the screen and still have the scientific depth that you can have in a paper with references. I also think another way of being present is through language. One thing that happened, uh, for example, working with the Swiss government, there was a real um, hesitancy, a real resistance to using a first-person narrative. You know, like, um, for example, the video that you wanted, that, that I showed by Kuno, at the very end, he talks about his own experience of, of this... Um, Imp improvisational concert that he experienced in the garage. But people would say, oh no, I, I can't speak in the first person. It's not about me. And so it's this, in, uh, this invitation really of, well, actually it is also about you. And so where are you in relation to this story? And I think that language very concretely of inviting the researcher, inviting the artist to, to take that uh, risk in one way of speaking in the first person as a way of claiming knowledge and embodied experience. Yep. I think because I come from like the commercial area, um, first of all, what I would think is like, where's the target audience? Uh, for whom do we produce these kind of videos? And uh, because I like formatting a lot, it's like the first things I would think about is like, how long should they be? Because if you do something like that, you have to format it, you have to determine how long they should be. And normally, like uh, if I work for museums or so, it's a classical YouTube, not longer than five to seven minutes, otherwise they click somewhere else. So this was something I would think about. And then it's like the genre, what do we talk about? It's documentary? Do we allow fiction elements? Do we allow animation elements? And you know, we did that the Leuphana and now um, Andre Senza is doing it here, all these kind of explainity videos which work well on certain, uh, certain circumstances. Are they allowed in these kind of papers or not? Because it's a very open range. Like, um, and we had the experience like, um, do we want somebody on screen who tells us uh, what he does? And this limits in a certain way the visual level what you can do. And we always think about like pulling them back, getting them out. We have like, uh, because otherwise like, because I think people like uh, also, the visual attraction is a thing. Um, and that's why I talk somewhere to museums, it's not good like just to film something, it has to have a certain value. Because it's a global competition, if people go there, see this, they are bored, they never return. So you have to do something about that too, I think, also in this context. I, yeah, definitely coming from media, these were, like I do share completely. Um, there are different mediums for different kind of stories. So I think, and I, I, I personally and genuinely think that you can never really, and I do join you there, is like you can never really get rid of paper completely. Because when you do a story, even if you're using the medium of, you know, video, there's still a written part. There's still a lot of research and writing and rewriting and going, pitching that story to somebody and telling them, no, no, you have to rewrite this again. Uh, what audience sees, it's just the end product. Whereas there's like at least one year, sometimes three years, or work behind it. And 
this is one thing is that it's there's always a written part. It's just you see that or you don't see it. It's just not avoidable. And the second question that would come to my mind from, from scratch is the quotations and the genuinity of the research and how do you do the stations and like, you know, un to, because when you're reading a, writing a paper, you have a lot of like different ad researchers that you take your, uh, that you follow the lead and then you have your thesis afterwards that comes with it. Where do you and how do you present that within the video form? It is, it is an interesting, it's, yeah. This is the, the uh, thing we try to salute, uh, solve with the uh, annotation format. Because this is kind of like uh, in footnotes in a paper, which uh, grant for some scientific depth in a way. And um, I would like to uh, uh, add to the, what you asked about the target group, because we've been talking about scientific uh, communication in the large public, which is very important, of course, but uh, the research paper and the research video is for communicating among artists, uh, among scientists, sorry, but also artists, of course, um, which is a completely different target group, uh, much smaller, and we don't have to deal with uh, such a high quality of video material, but it has to be referenced very well. And uh, the, the uh, criteria we have is it has to be challengeable. Uh, every detail has to be uh, reconstructed, can be followed back. And it has to be shareable. So everybody on the whole world can see it. So you have to transport it somewhere, uh, like a paper or a book. This is the two criteria we uh, have to deal with. material so you can do this because it's open open source so yeah. this will be also yeah of course how yeah yeah but well, we have to find this and I think the tutorial is a is an example of how it could maybe could have been done uh, just as an example if you write your PhD you maybe write 400 pages yeah but at the end you publish a research paper which is clear that this is internationally about 20 pages presenting the results of your research. And our question would be, couldn't, uh, how could the medium video, couldn't the medium video be also a first publication medium of research results like that, just as a video? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll take an optimistic approach to this, because I think that... Um, you're the American. We are the European, so you're yeah. the optimistic. <laughs> the, uh, the optimistic American approach. Because, you know, there's the optimism and there's also reality. So, because with the reality is that when you're in the lab for a biomedical scientist, um, you're quite busy. And you're, but you have your phone with you all the time or you have your laptop with you. And so, and, and I go back to you know, working with thousands of scientists in the US, it's not that the first option is to read the entire paper. You read the title, the abstracts, and perhaps maybe it's a mix. Maybe we keep the abstract format, which is 150 to 200 words. And the, but maybe once you start going into the results and the introduction, maybe that could be done in a video format. And I can see that for, for natural scientists that could work. But I'm thinking uh, perhaps um, even for non-natural uh, 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 scientists may be helpful as well because there is just, it opens up the opportunity to really engage and really to be present with your research. And I think that uh, part of it is that we're missing out on research. Uh, people watch videos anyway, so now when you publish papers, they'll have like a little side video on your paper and people go to that. And so they'll watch that or they'll watch other videos. Um, and maybe we can take a, um, lessons from science education in, in high schools. Now their students are, have these huge textbooks and they don't even open up the textbooks. They'll go to the Khan Academy. They'll go to other, and where there is no text and there's just uh, videos and then they'll do problems. And so maybe we can learn something from science educators and teachers from the gymnasium, um, from maybe an, an early primary education, they might be able to, to incorporate and bring into um, 
uh, for scientists as well, because I think it's just a practical approach. And I don't see too many scientists reading manuscripts. I see them skimming, but maybe they can get more information out of those manuscripts if there was a video that's properly annotated um, and referenced. Um, and if they choose to, maybe have some secondary sources. But I think the video, there may be some option, and maybe it'll start small and maybe pieces of the manuscript, and eventually uh, the whole manuscript. There's just, now that hearing you, actually, there's one maybe um, outlet that sort of, that comes to my mind, is that it has started, I don't know if any of you is familiar with Opdocs, uh, yes. or which is um, the Guardian, no, the, uh, yeah, the New York Times format, which has started at, as Opdocs, which are, these are like short, Doc, factual pieces, documentary pieces, highly POV, like creative POV storytelling. And it's always very so about social issues, current affairs, investigative stories. And now The Guardian has their own version of it. And recently, and it's, it's all coming from the United States because they're optimists, uh, that The Washington Post has um, a new sort of similar um, piece, like show, uh, with, with Anna Rothschild, who, the person, the scientist who has created Gross Science at NOVA. So basically the format might be actually a good, somehow a reference because again, you have like, I don't know, five pages of the in-depth analysis on on the newspaper, but you also have this short form, very well produced short form that is really to the point, is that sort of it gives the abstract, yeah. But th this might be somehow a, a way to explore. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we have to uh, think of different stories too. Uh, in different fields, like uh, in the morning, somebody addressed it in the audience. Uh, we were talking about quantitative uh, science in your case, but what do we do with qualitative research? It's a different story because we're not talking about uh, falsification and verification, which is a very good analogy to the conflict and fighting uh, if the hypothesis will die or live. Um, this is not the case in qualitative research. This is much more about pattern recognition and trying to understand and trying to interpret. So this is probably more as not a story of a hero fighting against the dragon, but it's more a discovery story, I, I think. What I um, think is, what I hear from scientists I know, they often say, okay, I do a lot of research, I write a write a lot of papers and I, do, I write my thesis, but in the end nobody reads it. So this is the big thing, I think. You, you have to write it. I think this is, yeah, I think it's, it's one way to write everything down yeah, during doing your research. But in the end, to reach a bigger audience, I think a video is the thing. <laughs> yes. We live in a send world, not in a receive world, somebody said. So we but I think, uh, isn't it like, um, uh, if you talk about like 400, 500 pages, it's the same thing, I think, from the, uh, we do pictures and fiction, or also for the bigger ones. We start the other way around, but it's, it's about like finding the right synopsis to something, which is really, really hard work, because it has to be very, very precise. Also the treatment status, which is like 10 pages, to a normal script, which is like 100, 120 pages. And the hardest thing to do is like the lock line. It's like uh, everyone thinks it's like <laughs> three, three lines to, to uh, 90 minutes from, but we always do it in the end because it's so hard, you have to have everything else, then you work for two weeks. Because like in the, in the uh, studio or like uh, financy business, they first of all read the lock line. If they don't like it, they don't read the synopsis, but if they like both, they start reading the treatment, in the end maybe someone reads the script. So the thing is like we always do in a way um, 
mood films, or we do mood boards, which have to be nowadays very, very precise. It's not only mood, it has a certain structure and has to represent the whole film all the time. And it gets tougher and tougher because everyone puts so much effort in it. So I think there's a good chance, if we talk about abstracts, to find a way to just script them, also find a visual basis to it, and then go for this one. And uh, limit it to five minutes, and then really like, I would pilot something like this immediately and think about how, how should we do this. Uh, and I think there is a way to do this. It's always a way, like, um, but on video, uh, it is good. And have the right channel to publish it. Mm. And have good uh, partners. Like, I would think um, also Tate, Tate Modern, if you talk about video in the museum context, yes. uh, they started immediately to do the cooperation with The Guardian. That's why they, they have good distribution channels, but also it's a very precise work. It's like it doesn't, um, it really fits the documentaries about architecture. They are small form, but the precise things I've ever seen. So they are good role models for something like that. Yeah, yeah. Art of Creative tries to copy all the time, Tim Modern, so, uh, but uh, um, they are very, very good. But I think, I think the question, you know, the, the, the broader question is once again publics and the audience. Who, who are we speaking to? And then, of course, the impact of the study and, and this question of writing and not being read. Um, I, I think that it, it's not just video, but, but really there are many different formats and many different platforms that researchers are beginning to think about. I, I mentioned Jason De Leon earlier in the presentation. I don't know if anyone's read his ethnography, The Land of Open Graves, but uh, it's a study of the U.S.-Mexico border. It's an excellent ethnography, very vigorously, rigorously uh, researched, beautifully written. And Jason De Leon is an interesting researcher because he um, had his, he's an archaeologist and also a cultural anthropologist. And he had a series on National Geographic uh, with another archaeologist. I don't know if anyone ever saw it, but it was like two archaeology guys crossing across, going across the United States. Yeah, it's very funny. It's very, it's very, um, it's, it's very, very humorous. Unbelievable, but, but he was in so much trouble for having agreed to do the series. But in the end, he wins because uh, his, his work, it has very, very broad viewership. And we're seeing this as well of people who are being able to, like I also think of Anna Singh, who was on the bestseller list in Germany for weeks and weeks and weeks for her ethnography studying mushrooms. It's really a study of Climate change, yeah. So, you know, you don't usually think of ethnographies making onto the bestseller list. But, yeah, it's about really thinking broadly of how we can reach broader publics. And, but then again, is this supported in the department as well? And, and I think these are the questions of how people understand science and what science does and who can and can't speak. Scientific journals, like important scientific journals, such like you know, for example, American Scientific or equivalent in Europe, accept to publish mm -hmm. native digital research papers. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily the article, but like the format mm -hmm. itself, like Guardian does or like New York Times does. And then we might actually have a broader audience. Uh, I mean, there's always YouTube, obviously, but... Yeah, we made a video about... Um, Mai asked... Um, oh, she, she was talking about the problem of um, science, of papers, because she says it's not the language everybody can read. So it's not, not the, the language people who doesn't have a um, scientist background, science background, sorry for my English, um, so she said it should be uh, um, a must. No. Um, uh, das Gegenteil von freiwillig. <laughs> it should be obligatory uh, to write like a short version of your whole thesis to make it to make it um, available for 
everybody, to let it understand, to, to let it be understand from everybody, yes. So I think this part could be the um, basis for the videos, so, yeah. Uh, well, sorry to be, the, to, to be a bit pushy maybe, but, but our, our topic, now we are talking about science communication now, but, but I really would like to stay for, for maybe another five minutes on, the, on this research thing. And also coming back to the quotation function and annotation function, because a, a research paper would have quotations, of course, in, in every paper. And how would we do quotations in a video? I call it now paper. Of course, it's not paper. But, and, that, and then, and, and if we do have a quotation or this annotation function like we do have in our research video project, then it's not a video anymore, but it's more a multimedia product or a, well, an interactive uh, audiovisual format, also dealing, maybe also dealing with PDFs or whatever to, to give you more, uh, more information. But the basis would be uh, the, 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 moving the moving images and the structured story for, for maybe 20 minutes, and it tells a scientific research story with data, annotated data. And how do you calculate here? And, and, and there could maybe the format of digitorial of Jörg, maybe you could explain it for a minute, but this, this could be an example. Okay. Or, or a format, a form, maybe Digi a form. Digitorial is another word uh, for, for us, like the one-pager thing we all know. Uh, just okay. called Digitorial because the Museum of Frankfurt named it like this, and then... Um, but it's a thing um, where you really treat... Um, because the museum was like a little bit bored about all the things, like the catalogs are still printed, and uh, I don't think who... Who really reads all the text in the catalog? Um, because they're very special, they're very uh, scientific in a way. So um, they try to reach for different target groups. What they did is like to get to this one pager and treat it in a special way with a special back end, which was programmed by, um, uh, they developed them with the. Um, with an agency from Berlin, so they could use it for every single um, um, exhibition they had. Um, and it was like a big social media, they, they do it before it comes out, before uh, the exhibition opens, so it was like used for the, uh, for the audience like to be informed before you go there and look it up after. The texts are different, they're more popular to have a different approach. But the thing is like, it goes like a film, it's a linear tool where you can use audio, you can use text, you can use, you can zoom in, you can zoom back, you can use film, and they develop it in different chapters so that you can jump to different chapters. And that's what I think, was thinking about, like if you have in one chapter annotations, nobody cares. So, so, so it will be additional background information. It's like the text you only can you have to, to uh, click on it to read them because if, if you need additional information, otherwise you, there are different approaches how to um, read this kind of one pager. And it sounds easy in a way, but it's very, very, um, even for museums, because now I try to bring it here to first of all linear storytelling and then like have all these different levels you can use. What's the real story? What do we want to tell? Um, but it makes, uh, it's very a free, it's very open in a way, how storytell. I think some museums will use more audio, one use more text, or uh, it depends also on the topic. They did a wonderful thing on Basquiat, where you had all the 60 mil material from, from New York, could you use it, so ha, it's more film. Um, and it's visually very, very attractive in a way. Um, and people like it a lot. So, um, and you can teach people how to use it uh, quite easily because the structure is so, it's so formatted in a way. Um, you can bring all the structures to different places. So, but it works well. Um, I think it's, it's very important for a research video that it's getting part of the scientific uh, community. It can be passed around. And it has to be, as you said, it has to be citable somehow. Yeah. 
which is uh, something we uh, try to solve in the research video by, uh, like in an in a article, you cite the article, you cite the date of appearance, you cite the author, you, uh, you uh, cite the page. And in a research video, you could do the same with a second of the video. Um, but we're also trying to add something like a, a showing gesture, um, which will uh, point to a specific point in the video at that specific, specific time. So, so uh, everybody can reference this at a very exact, in a very exact uh, way. But and would only, you do it only on if this works, the, the whole thing will be a, a contribution to the whole system of science moving forward and forward and forward. But will there be, is there a platform where you, where you have to, where do you put it on? Like, uh, it's not a YouTube channel. But, but, no, but it's a software developed. Um, have you seen it? It's on, on the computer ah, okay. side. You have a video uh, screen and, and, yeah, and you have uh, the annotations on the right side uh, displayed. But you can also have a, like something like a pointer in the video. So you have a second and you have a point in the video that you can reference and everybody can find it afterwards. Do you do also, I haven't seen it, uh, do you do also teasers on it? Is it somehow, or is it just the one application for each? So you have the papers, you don't do, how do you advertise it in the scientific world? Um, you, you, we hope to make it publishable. There are journals, uh, scientific journals, that accept video, and we hope that they will accept uh, this kind of video too. We are in cooperation with the research catalog, which is for artistic research only, but uh, they will they have agreed to uh, to make the platform apt for research video for annotated videos, so you can publish it online and it's like a paper, but it's not in uh, paper form of course. Does anybody know if if it, it does there exist a maybe peer reviewed journal just presenting videos uh, with research results, and if not, shouldn't we found? A, a journal just uh, publishing research videos. There is one in artistic research. It's yeah. the Journal for Embodied Knowledge. Um, they o it's only video, but it's only video essays at the moment. Yeah. And I think something similar is in ethnography. Right? Yes, um, there are a number. The Society for Visual Anthropology is developing an, on an online um, video platform where you can, well, it's an online journal where you can see videos and multimedia um, works. But, uh, yeah, it's not scientific communication per se. It's, it's the actual artifact. Also, Santas, the, the Swiss Ethnological Association, they have a visual anthropology section that is um, online. But we could still found a journal. Yeah. <laughs> and you can still found another journal. <laughs> in, that, in the uh, uh, biomedical research field, I think there's a, there's a journal that, that they post uh, laboratory techniques and experiments and how to do those. And so, but, you know, I think, you know, you, you, you sparked my interest with, you know, the third person and the first person. Um, and, and, I, and I think maybe uh, it's not that far-fetched because, you know, I, I, your platform seems quite, quite uh, good, but also I think Scientists have been doing this for a while, like conferences, like the Cold Spring Harbor uh, Laboratory Conference, which is one of the premier conferences for uh, biological uh, research in New York and Long Island. They'll, you go to the conference of 300 people and they record all the lectures. And you get to see the lectures afterwards and all the experts in the room. Um, I could you know, see maybe you know, unveiling in different ways, maybe at a conference and there may be peer review, maybe the, the peer rev, uh, reviewers are in the audience, might be able to ask some questions, maybe get the question answered even better, and then maybe they need to, you know, it might be this, because also it has to be peer reviewed, and so reviewed by the peers, so maybe that's also done by video or in the audience as well, or um, there are different ways, but I, th but I think even as, as uh, you know, scientists, uh, like I'm thinking about a lot of the Harvard medical scientists, when we want to learn, when they want to learn something from other scientists, they'll read some, but they'll go to those lectures from other scientists in their field and they'll listen to them, they'll spread the lectures around. And, uh, and I think the part of it, the Gunther you mentioned as well, the, is the reproducibility of it. And so, as you know, at a conference you can, 
explain your research, you can present your research, and it's acceptable. Um, and, and, some, and, and I think that's also, there's some authenticity to it as well because some people aren't comfortable sharing the results until right until publication. And so because there's something authentic about that as well, and maybe somehow we can encapsulate that, the authenticity that's on that stage where the presenter is there in front um, and vulnerable to the audience and presenting and presenting their research. Um, and I think you get more out of that than reading in a 2D paper that I don't think that you'll get that much. That's why a lot of people go to conferences because you hear plenty of talks in three or four days where you may go to about 40 talks, maybe you wouldn't read 40 papers in depth and get as much information out of it. So I think there is some, uh, some first steps that have already been done, but maybe to add on to that, I'm curious to, about that, that platform and, and how to incorporate, maybe inco bringing some of the old and, and with the new that there might be a way to do that to be where the scientists are more amenable to, to, this, to this innovation. Um, I just have a last question because we are, now we are doing, uh, you are dealing with art artists, uh, but working with uh, maybe at first time with a camera and editing and so. So is there a basic thing uh, how we should train researchers to use, uh, to use equipment or which equipment should they use or which would be a minimum standard? So um, yeah, I just wanted to... Or, or is there not a minimum standard and we need very well-trained uh, three years bachelor uh, uh, alumni to, to create uh, such videos? I think there should be a standard, but I can't tell you what it is because you're yeah. the expert. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there should be a, a very low standard for people to do it with uh, low equipment, uh, low tech equipment and one person only. If the iPhone, for because, example, the smartphone, yeah, for example. Because it's often we have the situation of uh, one researcher in this situation in one room. It's not, it's not, as in your case, a big production of anything, but it has to be very, very simplistic. Um, but I'm also thinking because like, I don't think uh, iPhone is not low end. iPhone is 4K now, mm -hmm. so you can do a lot. I just yeah. bought a gimbal for 100 euros and I filmed with it during Christmas. It's amazing what you can do. It really looks like a little, little steady cam, and the quality is amazing. It's stabilized very well. So I think they all should have like a one week course, yeah. like. Yeah. And uh, because it's not only maybe it's one camera, but they should do. And we did that at Leuphana, uh for for scientists. Like framing is also an option. Yeah. And there's the guy, and there's the object, and don't. Yeah, that, just spend 30 seconds more and then it looks... And if you do something, there have to be restrictions, there has to be these situations always filmed in that and that way, otherwise people get lost. And you don't, can compare anything, it gets the wild, wild west. So that's about the formatting, there have to be strong rules and there has to be a benchmarking how it looks. If you have no light and you have an object and you, de de you only see pixel, it's gone. Nobody looks at it. Because it had to have a certain level, I think. Because I'm teaching students, too, how to use a camera and how to film in a week. And you can do this. You have to be tough, but you can do this. And they see it. At, yeah. a, at an introductory level, for sure. Yeah. And I think that it's also about opening dialogue and beginning to, as I mentioned, being critical about what we're consuming. So people then beginning to notice, oh, that's, that shot is totally blown out. I can't see anything. Yeah. But creating a, a more critical understanding or engagement with media and then dialogue with filmmakers, with <coughs> photographers, with, with different visual artists as well. This was just a sound sign to involve the audience and to say if you have questions in the audience, and I see a very beautiful future for cast and other, uh, and the film department, just to offer expensive Weiterbildungskurse, etc., the car for researchers, and so, so this is a, 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 bright, a bright future. Now, we go to the audience. Uh, we have a mic for, for, for every question. Yeah. Um. I would like to follow up on the, on, on the end of, of your discussion uh, about the standards uh, mm. uh, that uh, should be, um, <coughs> uh, that, that, that should 
count for, for, for visual storytelling. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm missing, uh, let's say, a, a whole realm of uh, discussion here. Uh, you've been focusing on, on content on the one hand of storytelling. This is how you uh, tell stories. Uh, and on the other hand, on the effects and technologies of uh, the, the uh, visual storytelling, the, the iPhones and uh, the fact that if it's immersive and engaging, that, that all of that helps. What I'm missing is that visual rhetorics, visual language, have a very, uh, have a grammar and syntax of their own that is comparable but not the same as verbal argumentation. Uh, it's one reason why visual argumentation is actually much more difficult than verbal argumentation. Uh, now you can learn to uh, handle uh, a movie camera in a week. I'm, uh, I'm quite sure that that's possible. Um, but to argue specifically in a way that, that is scientifically valid uh, visually, that is a different, um, very different uh, level. So I wonder what the panel uh, thinks of that. Uh, is that something that should be, let's say, relegated to the, to the image makers, say the courses that you give, or should scientists become much more professional, so to speak, and much more um, uh, versed in uh, visual storytelling, in visual uh, argumentation? I think that's an excellent question. Please don't go away. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about it, but I don't have answers. But uh, for me, this is one of the chapters of the handbook we're going to write in the end, uh, which uh, is now called How to Make an Argument with Video, or Video Rhetorics. And uh, we will go into rhetorics and try to translate it into video but I don't have the answer yet. I think it's a key question because it's uh, one thing is like the framing and how to handle the camera. The other thing is like during the transfer, how to tell a story visually. The, a lot of examples of what we saw is like, what I see is like, we call it Doppelung. Um, you hear it, you see it. That's not film, film is something different. Even to work with a narrator is something you only do in certain cases, uh, because you are art to tell a story visually at first. This means if I have, I was always thinking about the abstract, then it's like not going like um, um, uh, the way a scientific paper would work, but using video as what are your USPs, finding the right pictures and also like moving a camera, using different means, animation, whatever, and finding a real, I would storyboard it. I would really find, and how are the transitions done to make it interesting? I think differently because I always think like it has to be appeal visually in a way. Nobody will take a look at it if it doesn't yeah. work that way. So, but it's also but this dangerous. is very difficult on this uh, whole, and then filmmakers drop in because this is what they do actually. Yeah. And I don't think filmmakers think of it as scientific storytelling. Okay. Because I, I, I wonder if there's just a semantic difference in the way that we're discussing this. Because certainly, yes, I mean, there is a screen grammar. There is a visual language that can be studied and, and learned. And I think I see this very differently as scientific visual storytelling. I'm not really sure what that is, actually. But when I think of it from a perspective of visual anthropology, I think of things like process films from the night and and these are horrifically boring if it, for personally I find them horrifically boring um I find them very dogmatic and pedantic and and not so interesting um so there that's my provocative comment but um I I do think that that is a, a very large area of discussion and dialogue around how that will be done and for me I, for me personally I enjoy rather working with filmmakers and photographers in that way of storytelling. That might be maybe a solution, one of the solutions, because yeah, one week crash course for filmmaking is just fine, but there's like years of years of narration studies behind it from a filmmaker's point of view, because in film, what you show, uh, what you don't show is actually as important as what you show, like what is on screen and what is off screen is, it's a whole different balance, and it's a, that is what narration is. But then maybe 
Um, I don't think you can offer crash course into that. There's no way doing that. But maybe they should team up. Actually. Yes, that's the point. I, like as they team up in their research yeah. with uh, with mind like scientists, maybe they should team up with mind like filmmakers. Yes. And like my and me did. <laughs> like you did. Yes. Exactly. A car student and, and uh, a scientist, they came yeah. together and I think it works. And that would work perfectly for us. <laughs> I, I completely <laughs> agree. <laughs> so I, I would like to one. Yeah, it's a, co a solution for the cooperation, but we don't have a solution, and I, I'd like to stress this point for uh, the su suggestibility of video, because it seems very plausible. Uh, 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 so something will appear as a proof, which is not a proof, mm -hmm. because you uh, uh, actually video is a, uh, or film is manipulating mm -hmm. in a very big deal, so it's very, it's, there has to be some rigor to the video argumentation, and I think this has to come from the science. Mm. It will not come from the video makers. I, th yeah. I would say it has to come uh, from both ways. Um, uh, personally, coming from uh, art history and graphic design and, and mm. having moved on towards uh, um, internet-based uh, media, media and, and digital media, um, I know, for instance, uh, that a, graphic, a good graphic designer, information designer, can make a huge difference in designing, say, uh, information graphics. Uh, the scientist uh, delivers a drawing, has to explain it, and then the graphic designer scratches his head and uh, thinks for uh, an hour or a day, and then comes up with something that does not even remotely look like the original sketch, but is readable. Uh, and does not need the uh, the explanation. So, so there, it has to to come from both ways. Yeah. That's it. But not everybody can have the have the same expertise. Exactly. Uh, just one one sentence from from my point of view. I think there is also we should make a difference between visuals and visualizing, and structuring a story, because structuring a story and the structure of a story is from novel to drama to theater to. To, to, to the movies is the same. And so we need a certain structure, and of course in the medium of film you have to visualize it, but the structure is the same. But um, yeah. the visual language also has a history and rules. So um, it's like only 100 years old, but um, that's what I'm telling my students. If you see Scorsese, he obeys the same rules as any YouTube video. And he's even better. And um, so um, that's because film work can work with scientists because we have both rules. Uh, but sometimes I think the scientists don't think that these rules exist, but they exist. Same thing as storytelling. Exposition is an exposition. It's an introduction. It stays the same. Yeah. So um, the thing is, like, the hard work is like, you described is like the transformation process onto finding something unique, which is far beyond than like doing a Doppler, just showing what we see. Um, this makes it attractive and this puts it on a different level. And this should be the aim, I think. Um, and then scientific uh, journals would like, it because it's a different way. If you, if you communicate in the same way as they do only in video, why should they do that? Uh, that's like you have to something find something new. The format has to be new, yeah. So um, it has to be attractive in a way. This was a very long answer to just Sorry. one question, <laughs> an answer of both of us. So six answers to one question. So maybe we should have more questions and shorter answers. Do we have more questions? Yeah. Um, my question is a little bit of a follow up to the one before. So to go a little bit deeper into this how, in a sense, um, the image itself um, can, or the produce the recorded image, can serve as a witness, or like to go into this whole discourse of witnessing, like proof, and not just translate the image as a translation of a science which is done elsewhere, um, in the lab or, or I don't know where, but like the making of the image as the proof itself. Like, I don't know if it's clear, but... Like, I, I think of um, artists like Trevor Paglen and, and, like, this whole line of... So, yeah, so how, like, to make an argument 
with the image making itself, mm. the production of a scientific document in that sense. I think there are very good examples from visual anthropology. I, I think of David McDougall, for example, and he's, he writes very eloquently about how um, he, he actually would argue that you don't want a film to be a replica of what one has witnessed, but actually that it's about creating something that is additional to that, or that, that the experience is like the impulse, and then the creation of the film is the journey that, that you make. I, I think he does consider his films scientific, but I think he also considers his films artistic. So he's really on the boundary between those two spaces. He doesn't really see it in a binary. Um, of course, we talked about Jean Rouge as well. I mean, I think that his work is very provocative in kind of, you know, he refused to see his work as data at all and, and really um, completely foreclosed that idea and saw the, the filmmaking process itself as catalytic and entirely about creating a, a catalyst for movement. And uh, once again, really seeing the embodied image as an inquiry process. Those are two um, an visual anthropologists that come to mind in response to your question. And I also I think that, um, um, you know, just, you know, we, we learn as we do. So maybe the bar doesn't have, it, we do need stand, you know, I, I think if we do a research video, there'll have to be standards. But I think as more scientists start entering into that space and submitting uh, their research for publication in the research video, and I think they'll become more advanced. They'll become more versed with making videos, teaming up with other videos. Like scientists now, they work with scientific writers to write better. Yeah. And so now perhaps if there's a way for them to get published, then they would probably team up with more um, video uh, people or take a class in video. And also rejection is good. So maybe their papers will get rejected and, and then they'll learn why. They'll get peer reviewed to say, okay, this was rejected because of this or it didn't meet our standard. And maybe they'll work a little harder to present that video and that evidence and that the, some of the, the evidence that they need to substantiate. Maybe they didn't present it in a logical uh, fashion, and so maybe they have evidence, but they didn't arrange it in, or fashion it in a way and they could storyboard it, then perhaps it, that would also be rejected until they, scientists can get better. And I think as we do, that's what happened with science as is today. We've evolved and gotten better at publishing with paper. Uh, and that's even involved the last 20 years to include more storytellers, uh, with their papers and scientific writers and also video people to do little video clips. They've gotten more high tech, but now just the, I think it's the next iteration would be with the video and then the rejection is good and papers should get rejected. Maybe there should be a high mark on, on getting papers accepted and then let people reach for it and get better and, and maybe they'll, this new era. And I see the, the motivation for journals is to, with videos is that they'll be watched by millions. So maybe no one might download a paper, but then they'll watch this video thousands of times and that would actually bring more revenue for uh, journals. And so that might be a, a, reven a revenue generator for them. And I think it'll be a win-win for everyone. So, And scientists would be learning more because they'll be getting it through video as opposed to just a 2D print. We um, have to come to an end. Oh. Um, I just want to pose a question uh, because up to now, uh, up to this point in history, video or film has at least been proof that something has happened. So you can present it as evidence that something has happened, but this might uh, not hold true for the future. So maybe we have a changing uh, landscape already. It's also, I mean, we don't, I mean, I know that this is your medium that you have chosen saying video, but there are, there are other ways. I mean, there are podcasts today that are like science podcasts yeah. out there. They're just amazingly successful. And because people still read, but they also listen more. Like audiobooks are amazingly successful. Podcasts are very successful. 
YouTube or that, like similar platforms are very successful. And I, I have to really join, I mean, when it comes to everything that is around video and everything, there has to be, at some point, there has to be a business model so that could actually push scientists to get into it, and then the filmmakers go to there and look for the next big story while they're doing, so there has to be something that is created alongside. But then somebody always will do the devil's advocate and ask, but if there's business, is it really research? I think it's melting uh, somehow. The, the science and science communication and science communication to the public are, uh, the, the, there's a boundary blurring. We have to, this is the part of the game change I was talking about. Is there one last question? I'm just looking if somebody, yeah, in the last row, yeah. Um, then two, just two questions, yeah. But the, I would just like to add one more thought on the specifics of audiovisual media. Like, let's say the, the simplest uh, transformation of a text-based paper would be the author reads his paper. <laughs> uh, that's, let's say, the two-dimensional transformation. If we consider the specifics of audiovisual media, let's say we have a multi-layered video uh, going on with audio tracks uh, added to it, and this could be connected to a metadatabase could be uh, included uh, text-based information, could be, uh, there could be links to online sources, et cetera. So let's imagine like the, the visual layer would be just the guidance layer of, of the main basic knowledge that has to be submitted to the audience. And then there would be so much more uh, additive uh, information. And even you could imagine like having an EDL that um, well um, conf conforms your different versions for different uh, target audiences. This is how I could imagine a audiovisual paper could look like in, in the future. I think this connects very much to what Raphael said. Uh, you could have the talks, the recorded talks of a conference, and add it with material, and uh, then add it as as a as a paper. Yeah. Last question. Uh, it's not a question, it's a comment, uh, actually. I uh, just want to mention an initiative happening here in uh, Switzerland um, called Exposure. It's a sci f uh, science film hackathon, uh, bringing together uh, scientists and filmmakers uh, for three days. Uh, and we just got a um, grant this year from the Swiss National Science Foundation, an Agora grant. And so the event happened for the third time in Lausanne in the fall. And it will happen in Basel uh, at the beginning of February and in Zurich in March. So there is this dialogue between scientists and filmmakers is happening. Uh, and we have now a database of about 30 movies. And we've had about 300 participants uh, so far. So it is, it is happening. Thank you very much. Please send us invitations and we will spread it in <laughs> our community. One thing. Um, after listening to you, what I would add is like if you build something like that, then usability and interface design gets very crucial. So I would add to the filmmakers and the scientists, uh, design. You have to get people and, and you have to pilot it and test it because this uh, sounds very logical, but how do the interface work? Uh, how is the usability, how, how you put it into a database so that everything is at what time accessible. This is like complicated, I think. And, um, that sounds good. Uh, piloting is all the thing. Do it. Yeah. You have to have built up standards. Like one last um, information regarding the comment that these like hackathons or what we call like symbiosis um, that have been like going on for a while now. Uh, in New York, there's a festival who has been doing it for a while. In Paris, uh, there is a science festival. They, it's, it's very funny where they're coming from because when they have first started, they have started as an ideas saloon where scientists would sort of come and talk about what they're doing to, to producers. But a producer is a producer. So he's not a filmmaker, he's not an author, he's not a writer. 
So they have very, very um, easily noticed that they needed to have writers there. So that, that story that the scientific research that the scientist was talking about could be actually transformed into a story so that average people could understand. So yes, we need piloting, we need designers, we need writers, we need filmmakers, and, uh, but, and we need authenticity somehow. So, uh, this is a totally positive message for us. <laughs> we need designers, we need filmmakers, we need writers, so, yeah. And then we'll bring the money, investors, so. don't worry. <laughs> now, thank you very much. We, we have a 10 minute break now, and then we will inform you with two lectures about uh, our specific project research video. And I would invite everybody who is, who's lectured or who will lecture today, please come on the stage. We will make one picture of, of all of us, just that we have a picture to remember. So thank you very much. <laughs>